We're continuing our studies in Chapter 12 on Metabolism and Bioenergetics, and in this lesson we'll be looking at storing nutrients. Fatty acids are stored in the form of triacylglycerols or triglycerides. Although we can store triglycerides in multiple tissue types, primarily we store them in adipocytes, and we have an electron micrograph of adipocytes here. Remember, these fatty acids, these triglycerides, do not form polymers, but they do aggregate, and so they form large globules in these adipocytes. It actually takes up most of the cell's volume. Now remember, this is a living cell, and so it must have an aqueous cytoplasm in order to carry out normal function. However, these aggregates or globules of triglycerides don't interfere with that process because of the hydrophobic effect, they're completely excluded from the cytoplasmic environment. Almost all cells can metabolize monosaccharides, but not all of them can store them. Muscles can store glucose as glycogen to a limited extent, but the primary storage facility is the liver. Here we have an electron micrograph of a liver cell. You can see a fat globule in yellow, mitochondria in green, and here are the glycogen granules in pink. Remember, glycogen has this branched structure, and that's pictured on the upper left here. That allows us to rapidly store or release it as we need. Now, what happens if we excess, uh, eat excessively on carbohydrates? Well, we'll we can only store so much as glycogen, and the rest is going to get broken down to acetyl units. That's a two-carbon compound. That gets converted to fatty acids and stored as triglycerides. So in other words, if we overeat carbohydrates, it gets stored as fat. Amino acids, of course, build polypeptides, but we don't build polypeptides for nutrient storage. They're for some other use. They have some function in the cell. Now, of course, we can break down proteins. They can be catabolized to supply energy. We have protein in our diet and that gets broken down through digestion and those excess free amino acids can be catabolized to give us energy. However, amino acids that are part of our normal cellular protein are not catabolized or broken down except during starvation. This is what we refer to as mobilizing amino acids, not using what we eat but actually breaking down cellular protein because we don't have any other resource. This is in a sense using our amino acid reserves, although they're not really intended for that purpose. So the body will first of all break down glycogen, it will then turn to its fat stores. Once that's gone and no food is taken in, the body will basically digest itself cellular protein to get the energy it needs. This is only under conditions of starvation. So what happens if we overeat proteins? Well, the excess amino acids that we take into our diet, it can get converted to carbohydrate and stored as glycogen, but remember we have limited cupboard space for glycogen. Once we store what we can is glycogen, the leftovers are converted to acetyl units and you guessed it, stored as fat. How nutrients are processed depends very much on the type of tissue and its needs or functions. As it were, it's metabolic toolbox. If we aren't taking any food in or if it's been some time since we've eaten, then we'll start to break down our stored fuels. Polymers are converted to monomeric units, and then we're going to process those monomers just as we would if we were taking it into our diet. The first thing that occurs is the breakdown of glycogen. The liver will break down glycogen to release glucose, and then that will get processed for fuel. The enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of glycogen to glucose, or the release of glucose, is the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. Remember the enzyme amylase we saw in the last lesson? It was a simple hydrolase. It clipped or broke the glycosidic bond and released a glucose molecule. Glycogen phosphorylase is not a hydrolase. It doesn't break the bond by adding water. Instead, it breaks the bond by adding a phosphoryl group, and that's what's illustrated here. 
So the breakdown product of glycogen by glycogen phosphorylase is not glucose, but glucose 1-phosphate. And we'll see more of the significance of this a little bit later. So this is phosphorolysis, that is lysis, by adding that phosphoryl group. If we're going to, if we're the liver and we're going to use it for in uh, cat catabolic pathways, we can just use this glucose 1-phosphate directly. However, if our goal is to release it into the bloodstream, we're going to have to take off that phosphate group. Remember, we have a glucose transporter. We don't have a glucose 1-phosphate transporter. And then that will get released into the blood. It will circulate in the body, and the different cells and tissues that need that will take it in as nutrients. Once we've used up our glycogen stores, then our adipocytes will start to mobilize our fat stores. For this, we need lipases. They'll clip off those fatty acid chains from the triacylglycerols, and then we can catabolize the fatty acids. Now, once we release those fatty acids, remember they're not water-soluble. And so if we want to release them into an aqueous environment, they have to be bound to some kind of a circulating protein. This is actually the last energy reserve to be tapped, that is, under normal conditions. Starvation conditions are another case, as we saw previously. Fatty acids represent a very high potential energy source, more so than carbohydrates or amino acids, and we'll see this more particularly when we get, when we get to Chapter 17. So why would you use your most valuable reserve unless it's necessary? So we're going to break down glucose first, and then if we need to, we'll break down the fat. In our next video lesson, we want to see, is protein degraded as a part of normal cellular function? And if so, how are they degraded?